where there's smoke, there's fire. When it came to the tobacco industry in the early 1960s, the fire was started by a burning question. Was cigarette smoking safe? President John F. Kennedy was asked just that at a press conference. It was political dynamite. Kennedy didn't want to deal with it. I mean, it really uh, it was just not an issue that any president has wanted to go near. It's a no-win for a president, especially a Democrat, because uh, the Democrats were beginning to worry about losing the South. The South is tobacco, and uh, you just don't make friends by attacking tobacco. Uh, and his way to deal, deal with it was the way most people deal with it, to call for some kind of a study and to bring the Surgeon General into it. The political climate was affecting what was on the TV air. Turn on the television in 1962, and in addition to cigarette ads, there was something quite new, an anti-smoking announcement. Where the button? I did the commercial with the two children dressing up in their parents' clothing. Did mommy look like that? Children love to imitate their parents. Children learn by imitating their parents. Do you smoke cigarettes? <laughs> it made them aware of the fact that they were affecting their children. January 1964, Washington, D.C. The government was about to butt in. The Surgeon General's Advisory Committee issued its report on smoking and health. And it was a true media event in every sense of the word. The journalists were led into the auditorium and the doors were locked and carts were rolled out with the report with a secret wrapper around it. It was held on Saturday to avoid any disruption of the stock market because it was pretty well understood by those who knew anything about it that this report was going to be a bombshell. It is the judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. And it had uh, a dramatic effect on the industry, on sales, at least temporarily for that first year. And like a lot of industries, the tobacco industry wasn't terribly sophisticated in dealing with the news media. They were sophisticated when it came to their marketing, the advertising side of it. But in responding to uh, an aggressive, almost hostile media environment, they had no experience. But I think what happened is that the Tobacco Institute put out a dragnet for every scientist that could breathe around the world to identify the 38 scientists who were who one of my colleagues called the Flat Earth Society, the scientists who still believed there wasn't enough evidence. And they brought them in one after the other to testify that uh, they just weren't convinced the evidence was in. That's beautifully orchestrated. Studies and counter studies fueled the debate. Pressure mounted for Washington to take visible action. The Federal Trade Commission acted shortly after the Surgeon General's Committee report to require a warning, putting the warning label, a very mild warning label on the package. Remember, caution, cigarette smoking may be hazardous to your health. The labels were not required on TV ads. Senator Robert Kennedy soon picked up the torch. He summoned the heads of the tobacco companies to Washington for a meeting, and they came. He had no power as a chairman, he just was Bobby Kennedy, Senator Bobby Kennedy. And uh, he said to them, you've got to do something about cigarette advertising. And he said, I think maybe you ought to get off television at least before uh, the 9 o'clock. And uh, uh, he made them very nervous, but uh, they didn't do anything about it. If they were to go, what would be the catalyst to get them off? What happened was I was sitting watching football games one Thanksgiving afternoon with my father and just watching the whole collection of commercials. It was the most widely advertised product at the time. Suddenly something clicked. A rule, a principle, the fairness doctrine, something I had learned about in law school, might be used to do something about this problem. Here's something else you ought to try, and soon. Lucky strike. The Fairness Doctrine is a rule of the Federal Communications Commission, which says that if a station chooses to broadcast one side of what they call, quote, a controversial issue of public importance, end quote, they must provide some time, not equal time, but fair time for a presentation of the other side. Well, I thought the Fairness Doctrine might pertain to cigarette advertising simply because the words controversial issue of public importance certainly applied to cigarette ads. They were presenting one side. 
that smoking made you glamorous and sophisticated and sexual and so on and so forth. They weren't telling the other side. I decided to try and see if we could apply the Fairness Doctrine to cigarette commercials. The papers were filed. Now, the waiting game. We never had a hearing. There was never a response. There was never an oral argument. There was never a presentation of evidence. There was nothing. And suddenly, in June of 1967, the FCC came down and handed down its decision. I found out later they hadn't really given it much thought. I was told that the whole decision was arrived at during a coffee break in another, to them, much more important proceeding. And they just kind of got around, yeah, sure, it applies. Why not send the kid a letter? And off it went. John Benshaf, the man who fought the cigarette companies and won under the Fairness Doctrine, worked for a law firm whose major client was Philip Morris. In fact, Philip Morris even owned the building. Banzhaf left to form ASH, Action on Smoking and Health. When Time Machine returns, the final battle over airtime and a surprising turn of events. In 1967, the Federal Communications Commission ruled that networks and local stations had to air anti-smoking public service announcements in response to the Fairness Doctrine. When did they routinely air? After everyone was asleep? For a long time, we were running them in anything but prime time. Uh, two o'clock in the morning was a perfect time for anti-smoking PSAs, as far as we were concerned. Here are four good reasons for quitting smoking. <coughs> then we had to run them in prime time, and then I remember a specific ratio that was created. I don't know how it was created. Uh, for every three that we accepted, we had, uh, had to allocate a commercial time period in the same day part uh, for uh, one anti-smoking PSA. How about you? For your health and well-being, quit smoking. Kick the habit and join the unhooked generation. But in this particular situation, there was a press conference held at the Federal Communications Commission, and a reporter asked Henry Geller, who was then the general counsel of the FCC, well, what's fair? Do you think one anti-smoking message for every three cigarette commercials might be fair? And he said, yes, I think that might be fair. Well, that was a wonderful thing for us, because Geller later told me somebody had said five to one. He probably would have said yes, maybe even seven or ten to one. This time, they really mean it. They've absolutely quit cigarette smoking. The networks were going to have to give away their time. And nobody who has a product they are selling enjoys the prospect of the federal government saying, you're going to have to give a third of that away. And you may not care for the message at all, but that's the way it is. It really was devastating because it was time we could have sold, number one. And number two, we realized that everyone that ran, the more effective it was, the more likely it was to cause uh, a downslide uh, in cigarette revenue. What the tobacco industry found was that for every three or four commercials they ran, our side got an anti-smoking message. Ours were much more effective than theirs in the sense that consumption was dropping, so they definitely wanted to get off the air and stop advertising on radio and television. Only you can stop it, Dan. You must make the move right now. Cross my palm with your cigarette pack. Now go and smoke no more. The more the anti-smoking spots aired, the more people were turned off by cigarettes. Well, tobacco companies weren't about to let their profits go up in smoke. Well, anytime anybody is able to get public service time to denigrate a lawful product, the people who make that product are going to get upset about it. But given the nature of the debate over smoking health, I don't think anybody in the industry thought for a moment that this was something that the American people ought to be prohibited from seeing. And I think the industry uh, was prepared for a lot worse to come. And they certainly got it. Worse meant there might not be any cigarette ads allowed on TV at all. As uh, the uh, problem developed, there was more and more time bought by the cigarette companies because they began to realize that uh, they were going to run out of time and they wanted to spend as much money as possible when they were still on the air to position their brands. You 
it soon became clear that the, the television and radio environment was extremely unfriendly. Who in their right mind would want to continue advertising under those circumstances? To continue advertising would mean the continuation of anti-smoking announcements. And in time, they would become even more effective, more prolific. The tobacco industry went to the smoke-filled rooms in Congress with a plan of escape. First, they thought that uh, they asked Congress to give them an exemption from the Antitrust Act so they could get together and agree among themselves, make a contract not to do any more advertising. It would have been a violation of the antitrust law, ironically, if the companies got together and agreed to get off television, and no single company could do it. Clearly, cigarette companies wanted out. Broadcasters, meanwhile, were finding themselves in the position of losing cigarette ad revenue for the greater good of the country. Were they willing to be so magnanimous? Once the tobacco industry came to us and said, we're ready to get off television, the networks panicked. And so the battle royal was between the tobacco industry, who wanted to get off as quickly as possible, 69 if they could, and the broadcasters wanted to keep them on the air as long as possible so they could fill up that spare time. The networks were predictably uneasy, furious perhaps, because they could see a virtually irreplaceable source of revenue going right out the window. And they then came up with their own alternative. They came to us and they said, we have a proposal. Uh, instead of a ban, um, we would agree to allow to advertise only cigarettes which are low in tar and nicotine. No deal. Congress, the Surgeon General, leading health experts all said cigarette ads should go. And the tobacco companies went to Congress and they said, listen, we've gotten religion. We realize that uh, selling cigarettes on television may appeal to young people and we don't want it to happen it's the wrong crowd watching it we made the very tortured long thought out decision uh, in 1969 then to voluntarily withdraw from radio and television this is never an industry that's done anything altruistically or because they believe in the first amendment or for any abstract thing like that there's only one thing this industry has ever focused on and that's bucks so the next big uh, step was the 1969 Cigarette Act, which banned cigarette commercials effective January 2nd, 1971. One minute before the ban, 11.59 p.m., January 1st, 1971, viewers of The Tonight Show saw history in the making, an end to one era with the acknowledgement of another. you got Virginia slips now, baby. you come a long, long way. Tobacco industry people come in and say, oh, you know, we're not going to fight this and we'll obey the law. We'll never spend anything near what we spent on uh, television advertising for print or broadcast advertising, uh, print or newspapers or magazines. We won't increase our expenditures. And Congress left the tobacco industry alone for almost, for more than a decade. It wasn't until 1984 that Congress passed, again addressed and passed significant tobacco control legislation when they strengthened the warnings. So they got a 15-year ride out of getting off television. I think you had to take it off. I think anything that, um, that can damage the public should not be advertised. If cigarette advertising was going to be banned, it should have been banned on all media. Uh, I cannot, I could not then, and I still cannot accept singling out a single medium for that kind of uh, prohibition. It just doesn't make sense. Once we knew that, that smoking wasn't good for you, um, I, I think it makes a lot of sense to take it out of the one medium which sold it the best. The death of the cigarette TV ad also meant the end of most anti-smoking public service announcements. Broadcasters were quick to take them off the air. A postscript, the debate over cigarette commercials continues in the nation's courts. Personal injury suits have been filed based on some claims from the early tobacco industry's TV commercials. Perhaps the story of cigarette advertising on television isn't over yet. I'm Jack Perkins for Time Machine. Thanks for watching. Now at last, wherever you are, at home, at the office, or like this couple on a honeymoon trip to the Argentine, now you can enjoy the best taste yet in any cigarette. Old Gold cures just one thing, the world's choice tobaccos. To give you a treat, instead of a treatment. 
Ruth takes packs of Luckies right from the production line. She cuts